As you look up Acts 21, 22, I should have said at the beginning of the service, where it's always a delight to welcome people who are in church for the first time. And, uh, and this morning we have Georgie, who is about to listen to his first sermon. So congratulations to him. Um, but it's, it's just wonderful to have him. You saw him here featured on screen last week, but he's here in the flesh. So um, our, our congratulations and our prayers are with um, Sophie and Matthew and the family. Acts 21 um, from verse 37. Try for a moment to put yourself in Paul's sandals, to imagine what it would have been like for him that day. It will help you if you were here last week, what it would have been like for him that day as people began to shout abuse at him in the temple, as they threw false accusations around. And then, with all the frenzied fervor of combined religious passion and nationalistic pride, they started baying for his blood try to feel with him the manhandling and the punches that start to fly and the well-aimed kicks. Try to imagine in the chaos of the moment, disoriented by these blows, the realization that they are dragging you towards the exit because they fully intend to kill you right now. And then suddenly the Romans appear And before you know it, you're chained to a couple of burly soldiers, and you're being physically carried up the steps to the Roman barracks. And maybe it's now, just right now, that some words come to you. You weren't there when they were spoken, but you know the apostles, and they have told you all about them. It was Luke who who recorded them. They will lay their hands on you. Jesus spoke those words. He may have spoken them in this very place, in the the temple itself. It was during the last week of His life. They will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for My name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness." This will be your opportunity to bear witness. It is just guesswork, but I wonder if that statement of Jesus in Luke 21, 13 popped into Paul's mind in this moment, because that's what he now does, isn't it? He seizes the opportunity to bear witness. He asks the people to hear his defense. In some ways, his defense is very strange. Um, No defense lawyer would have taken the approach that that Paul takes here. He doesn't even mention the charge of bringing a Gentile into the part of the temple where Gentiles weren't allowed to go. He could have dealt with that very easily. It just wasn't true, and they didn't have a shred of evidence that it was. But of course, Paul isn't really interested in defending himself at all, is he? His whole focus is on defending the gospel. The Greek word, the the, the word that he uses here for defense is the word apology, um, which which is not kind of in the sense of being sorry for something as we use the word now, um, but it's the word for a defense, and there is a whole branch of theology called apologetics. You may have heard that word. Apologetics is the art of defending and commending the Christian faith. Apologetics explains how the Bible and only the Bible makes sense of life. It explains how Christianity is actually true. So this is what Paul does. He he mounts a, a defense, an apologetic. And since God's people in every age are called to testify to the truth of the gospel, and since in every age God gives us opportunity to bear witness, we're going to just note some features of Paul's approach. He models for us what it looks like to tell people about Jesus sensitively and faithfully and powerfully. The first thing I want us to see is that Paul's speech here is compassionate and courageous. The fact that he asks to speak at all is just astounding, isn't it? If you did manage to imagine yourself into his sandals there for a moment, you're in fear for your life, everything is chaos, these people despise you, they want you dead, they're doing everything in their power to kill you, when suddenly, out of nowhere, you're rescued. The Romans appear, the crowd is beaten back, and you're on your way up the steps to the garrison, which represents relative safety. 
So, so yes, you've been arrested and you're in chains, and no, they're not going to book you into a four-star hotel, but they're not going to kill you on the spot either. This is the way out. And, and you know, I'm pretty certain that under those circumstances, I would have been praising God for this miraculous deliverance and looking to see the inside of that barracks as quickly as I could. What does Paul do? Whoa, 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 stop, stop. Mr. Tribune, sir, can, can I say something? Can I speak to you? Verse 39, I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. It's striking, isn't it? Instead of heaving a sigh of relief and getting to safety, this is my opportunity to bear witness. And what he does in staying to address the crowd demonstrates compassion and courage in equal measure. It's obviously courageous, isn't it? A well-aimed rock could still put an end to him. Things could still spiral out of control again. So why does he take the risk? Well, he takes it for the glory of God and for the honor of Christ, but also for the souls of the men and women in front of him, out of compassion for them. They want him dead. He wants them saved. He wants them to know everlasting life. Paul, he's displaying for us in action, the principle that Peter sets out. Do you remember Peter in his first letter, 1 Peter 3? It's a very relevant passage. It's the passage where Peter says that we should always be ready to give a defense, an apology, an apologetic um, for the hope when someone asks us for the hope that is in us. But just before that, he says this, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called. Throughout history, God's servants have responded to reviling with blessing. Jesus did it. Father, forgive them. Stephen did it. He began, brothers and fathers, here. He ended, Father, do not hold this sin against them. As they stoned him to death, those were his dying words. Here, Paul does the same. People are trying to kill him. He's trying to save them. There's a great entry. You, you follow it through history. There's a brilliant entry in the journal of John Wesley. At the time, he would preach the gospel in the open air. Um, at a time when he was opposed by unbelievers who, who came to mock, and sadly by the established churches who, what are you doing preaching the gospel in the open air? In September 1742, Near Whitechapel in London, Wesley began to preach to a gathered crowd, and some troublemakers arrived. Um, their first, you'll like this, their first attempt to disrupt things was to drive a herd of cows into the congregation. Um, but the cows were uncooperative, they just kind of wandered off, and it kind of fizzled out. Um, and then they resorted to more direct opposition. So Wesley's journal entry says this, a stone struck me just between the eyes, but I felt no pain at all, and when I had wiped away the blood went on testifying that God hath given to them that believe not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I mean, you've, you've got to love that, don't you? When I had wiped away the blood, I kept on telling people about Jesus. What? You know what I think? I think, ooh, someone called me a name. Poor me. When I had wiped away the blood, you know, history, history is full of the tales of men and women who gladly shed their blood for the privilege of telling people about Christ. That has, all of this has implications for our witness, doesn't it? It tells us, for one thing, that the spirit of our evangelism, the heart in it, is, is in a sense, it's, it, as important as the words that we speak. The love that we show, the tenderness of heart, the endurance of opposition, the patient perseverance in the face of persecution, rejection. In a world that's increasingly angry and combative, it's easy, isn't it, to retreat into a kind of fortress mentality, to begin just unconsciously, to begin to see the unbeliever as the enemy. This is the person I have to argue against and oppose. We, we need such wisdom from God, don't we? 
there is a rightful kind of contending for the gospel. There are times, I think it's especially when, when people are standing in the way of other people hearing about Christ. Then, then there are times that it needs forceful opposition. But, and there are, there are times we know when the right response to a clear rejection of the gospel is to walk away, shake the dust off your feet, and take the gospel elsewhere. But I, I think what we see here is actually the rule rather than the exception. I think those are the exceptions. I think this is the rule. We are called with courage and compassion in equal measure to meet opposition with patient perseverance, to meet reviling with blessing, to meet hatred with love. Not long since Paul wrote Romans, as he stands there that day, Romans 12, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Never avenge yourselves. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Um, A little while ago, I watched a film, and I think this is about my fourth sermon illustration from this one film, so it'll be my last, I promise. Um, unless I change my mind. Um, But a film called A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, Um, Fred Rogers, uh, bizarrely a Presbyterian pastor who who became an unlikely TV personality with this show that ran for decades, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Um, His show was designed to instill in children a sense of their worth, uh, to display the power of simple kindness and friendship, and generations grew up watching this quiet, gentle, kindly man, softly spoken, slow speaking, um, just affirming them, helping them to believe in themselves. It, it's, it's gloriously old-fashioned. You can watch episodes of it on YouTube. You should have a look, Fred Rogers. And, and the film is about, is the story of a cynical journalist who came to, he was determined to unmask the real Mr. Rogers. This, this must be a persona thought this man, because no one is this nice. No one is this kind. No one is this disinterested in self. There must be an agenda behind this. Who is this man? I'm going to go, and I'm going to expose him. And and as he tries to do this, he becomes more and more exasperated because he just is met with the gentle kindness of Mr. Rogers. Totally consistent. And there's a scene, there's at one point he, he's interviewing him, and he asks him what it was like for his children. He says, you have a couple of boys. It can't have been easy for them growing up with Mr. Rogers, the famous Mr. Rogers as their father. And it's designed as a, as a, as a kind of gotcha question. Um, it's designed to expose the stuff that comes out in family life. You know, you can keep a facade in public, but family life is where it comes out. And, and he's, I'm going to dig into this. It must have been hard for your kids. And Mr. Rogers pauses. I think you're right, he says. It, it wasn't always easy. And there were hard times. But we worked through them as a family. And we're very close. We love each other very much. But yes, he says, yes, I think you're right that it can't have been easy for them. And then he adds quietly, thank you. Thank you for the kindness of your question. Thank you for thinking of them. And at this point, the journalist throws his hands in the air, says, I can't take this anymore, and walks out of the room. It's one of the just, one of the most striking instances I've ever seen of not being overcome by evil, but overcoming evil with good, simple good. Paul's defense of the gospel is compassionate and courageous. Secondly, it is calm and coherent. He shows amazing presence of mind given the circumstances. You can't tell this in translation, but to get the attention of the tribune in the middle of this riot, he addresses him in formal, educated Greek. Excuse me, please may I speak with you? And the tribune's like, whoa, what? 
Are you not this Egyptian terrorist then? Are you not the guy that led all the assassins, the dagger men? I'm in the revolt a while ago. You can read all about it in Josephus. This guy that came and declared the walls of Jerusalem are going to fall like the walls of Jericho and we're going to take it. And he got as far as the Mount of Olives and the Romans came out and arrested them all and he ran away. Um, and, and for some reason, the tribune thinks that this is him come back and, and, and causing more havoc. Instead, he discovers that this is a man of intelligence and culture and substance. And, and it's probably because of that that he lets him speak. Paul motions with his hand to the people, which is a kind of orator's gesture. It's a kind of formal, something that people would have recognized in the day. He, and, and actually, subconsciously, the response of the, of the crowd would have been, here's someone who knows what he's talking about. Here's someone who knows what he's doing. He's, he's an orator. We, we need to listen to this man. And, and then he switches to the Hebrew language, which might have been Hebrew. The, the scholars think it's more likely to have been Aramaic. That was the common language of everyday speech by this point. And the sound of Aramaic coming from this Gentile sympathizer as they see him is enough to get their attention even more. And a great hush descends on the crowd. Paul is just, he's brilliant. In, in a few moments, he has just taken control. He has a presence. People are listening. And partly it's that he's a brilliant man. He's a clever man. But think also again of what Jesus said about moments like these. It was, it was Luke, again, who recorded them in volume one. Luke 12, Jesus says, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. The Spirit of God will be with you. Luke 21, speaking about the opportunity to bear witness, that passage um, he says, settle it in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. And I think that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing the Lord Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, giving Paul the words to speak in this moment. And so he begins, and like any expert witness giving evidence, the first thing you need to do is establish their credentials. Why should we listen to what they have to say? What authority do you have to speak on this subject? And Paul establishes his own impeccable credentials. Look at verse 3. I am a Jew, he begins, born in Tarsus in Cilicia. He's a loyal Jew by birth and by choice. I was brought up right here in Jerusalem. I studied under Gamaliel, who was one of the best-known rabbis of the day. I was raised by the strict manner of the laws of our fathers, zealous for God. Do you remember and he describes himself in Philippians 3 as the Hebrew of Hebrews. You want Jewish, he says. There ain't anyone more Jewish than me. I persecuted the way, the Christian faith. <laughs> what, what is all of this? What, what all of this says is this. Think you're zealous for the law. Hi, Paul of Tarsus, nice to meet you. It's the, it's the moment in the party where you're You've been bragging for the last five minutes about how great you are at tennis, and, and the guy says, I don't think we've met. Roger Federer. <laughs> He's saying to them, look, I'm the zealot of zealots. I get it. I, this passion, I, I, I was exactly where you are. This passion that you feel for God's will to be done, I know it. This rage that you feel, this desire to rid the earth of anyone that dishonors God, I I've been there. And all this emphasis on his own thoroughgoing Jewishness leads seamlessly then into the calm, coherent argument that he's making, which is that the message he is proclaiming is the continuation and the fulfillment of Jewish hopes. What he says is, is basically this, there is nothing more Jewish than Christianity. There's nothing more Jewish than Christianity. It is Israelite in its very DNA. And the other side of the coin then is that when Judaism is properly understood, where it leads is directly to Jesus the Christ. So yes, something new has happened Yes, there's a new message being proclaimed. These are new shoots, but they are new shoots from old roots. 
the message that I'm preaching all over the world, this is your God fulfilling His promises to you. This is your faith bursting into full flower. This is your every hope fulfilled in Jesus. Because, of course, that's, that's where He wants to go with always, all the time, always pointing to Jesus. And that's where His story goes from verse 6. It was the risen Jesus who stopped Him in His tracks, literally and metaphorically, on the road to Damascus. It was the reality of Jesus of Nazareth, risen from the dead, alive, powerful, and speaking to Him. It, that, that's what jolted Him into new life, like a spiritual defibrillator. Bang! And He's alive. What Paul suddenly saw that day when he became blind was simply that if Jesus is risen then He is Messiah. If He is risen, He is Messiah. And that was confirmed by these wonderful words of Ananias at verse 14. I wonder if they struck you as we read them. The God of our fathers, Israel's God. This is Israel, Israel, Israel. The God of our fathers appointed you, Paul, to know His will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. That, that expression, the righteous one, we came across that a few weeks ago. We came across it in the servant songs in Isaiah. It's in um, the, one of the passages in the Bible that refers most obviously to the coming Messiah, the servant of the Lord. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Isaiah 53. The righteous one, my servant. We'll return to Paul's story in a moment, but notice what he does here. I think this is hugely helpful for our Christian witness today. He takes something that is deeply precious to his hearers. In this case, their zeal for righteousness and for the glory of God. And he says, this is right. And I share it. This is what I long for too. But let me show you how Jesus is the key to it. Let me show you how Jesus is the key to righteousness and the key to the glory of God. He knows the hopes and dreams of the Jewish people. He says, you're right to long for God to be honored. The nation, the law, the temple, these things you're concerned about are so precious. But let me show you how Jesus is the key to this. For us today, in a, in a secular context, the point of contact is going to be completely different, isn't it? But the principle is the same. Listen to this. This was um, 350 years ago. Blaise Pascal, brilliant mathematician and a Christian, and, and he set out a three-stage a three recipe for apologetics. This is, this is Pascal's um, outline of apologetics. Stage one, show that religion is not contrary to reason, but worthy of reverence and respect. Paul does that here. Stage two, Make it attractive. Make good men wish it were true. And Paul does that here. This is the key to righteousness, to the glory of God, to everything that you treasure. Show it's not contrary to reason. Make it attractive. Make them wish it was true. Stage three, show them that it is true. Because if you just jump to stage three, they won't care, and they won't listen, and they won't believe you. Not contrary to reason. Make it the try, make them wish it was true, show that it is true. That's helpful. That's a really useful thing to have in our minds. How do we today make people wish that Christianity were true? Well, by showing them that Jesus is the fulfillment of every legitimate desire they've ever had. Because he is. He's the treasure of all treasures. He's the heart of the universe. He's the pearl above price. He's everything. There's, a, there's a, a recent book by a man called Daniel Strange. He called it Making Faith Magnetic. Making Faith Magnetic. 
Um, he sets out five themes that um, our culture talks about all the time. Uh, things that we can tap into to, to show how it's Jesus they're really looking for. I'll just, don't worry, you're not going to remember these, but it just gives you a flavor of the kind of thing. So first he talks about what he calls how we connect. Do we somehow fit into something bigger than we are? We sense that we should. We should connect with something bigger, with other people, with the environment we live in. And, and, and if so, how do we connect with something bigger than us without losing our individuality and our identity? There's a theme in our culture today. Our culture struggles with that all the time, how we connect. Second theme, how we live. We all believe in moral codes. People like to say they don't. It's a lie. We all believe in moral codes. It's just where we get them from and and how we can justify them, where they come from, are they real, are they made up, and how do we know? And if we can't agree on these things, how can we exist together? That theme runs through our culture today. I mean, that is on display in every news item you will ever watch. Third theme, how we escape, how we connect, how we live, how we escape. How do we find a way out of all that is oppressive and harmful about life? Why do we have this sense that something is broken in the world and even in us, And how is that brokenness to be fixed? Fourth theme, how we control. We have a sense, or at least we want to think, that we're in control of our own lives and we set our own course and determine our own destiny. But standing in constant tension with that is the sense that so often we feel like passive participants in someone else's world. What is happening? Why do we feel these things? The fifth theme, how we transcend Is there something beyond the everyday experience of our senses as human beings have always suspected? And if so, how do we connect with it? These questions are running around the whole time. Pick up a a magazine or or a newspaper or a book. These questions are there. They come up in different forms, but they're there. This is how Daniel Strange summarizes it. These points, these five points, are all pieces of one gigantic puzzle that on the box shows the picture human existence. This is life. Everything we do in our lives is an attempt to make these pieces fit together. Or to put it another way, these points are five itches that we're always scratching as we try to find some relief from the irritating questions we have about ourselves and our world. Now, that's all high-level stuff. How does it come out um, in the office this week or or in in the living room with your family? why am I never satisfied at work? Why, why do I always long for more? Why is this so rubbish? Why do my relationships keep failing? Why can't I find anyone I can trust? Why is the world in such a mess? Why is the human race not getting better? Any of those, that, those are the beginnings of a gospel. This is your opportunity to bear witness. The point is to be alive to how these things connect to Christ. Yes, you do have longings that won't be satisfied by work. Where do you think they come from? Yes, you have been betrayed by others, and it's horrible, and I'm sorry. Why do you think you have such a strong sense that you should be able to trust people and not be let down? Why does faithfulness matter so much? Yes, the world isn't a mess, but why do you think we sense it should be better? Paul taps into distinctively Jewish hopes and dreams, but every person in the world has human hopes and dreams built into all of us. God has put eternity in our hearts and a conscience and the longing for love and intimacy and the sense that pain is wrong and the desire to be individual and yet connected and and so on and so on. And any of these things can be a point of contact through which we show that one way or another, Jesus of Nazareth is what you need. He is the answer to your question. 
by God's grace, we too can show people calmly and coherently how what they're truly looking for can only be found in Him. Paul's approach is compassionate and courageous. It's calm and coherent. He has all the building blocks of a convincing case for Christ, but what cements them all together is the power of personal testimony. And so he is finally clear and compelling as he tells of how God saved him and sent him. Sometimes we're tempted, sometimes almost invited by by some people to choose between rational argument on the one hand and personal testimony on the other. Now, don't make these rational cases. Just tell your story. People like stories. And then you tell a story and people say, well, that's very good that that's your truth, isn't it? And I have my truth. What Paul, what's fascinating about this is that Paul's speech here contains rational, coherent argument, and it contains personal testimony, but you can't really pull them. You can't, you can't say verses such and such are this, and then you, it, the whole thing interweaves continually. The whole thing interweaves. His own life becomes a demonstration model for the way that, in this case, the way that zeal for the glory of God, a good thing, can go wrong, and the way that it can be redeemed. Our lives can do the same. They can show the false paths that we tend to go down, and then how God, in grace, led us home to Him. Paul's been so careful, hasn't he, to show himself standing shoulder to shoulder with these passionate Jewish believers who hate him so much. He refuses to stand against them as if they were enemies. He certainly doesn't stand over them as if he were superior. He stands with them. Look, I'm a Jew. I'm like you. I'm a Jew. I'm passionate for righteousness. I'm zealous for God. I always was. And like you, I believed with all my heart that only the strictest obedience to the law could possibly make a person acceptable to God. Like you, I wanted to do away with anyone who would compromise anything about this and endanger this holiness, this righteousness. But then I saw Jesus of Nazareth, verse 8, and I knew that He is the righteous one. He is the righteous one. And having hunted down righteousness all my life, having served it with all the fervor of which I was capable, it was revealed to me in a moment that with all my zeal, I was working as hard as I could against the purposes of God. I was not righteous. I was not righteous. It dawned on him, to borrow his own words from Romans 10, it dawned on him that he had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, because he sought to establish a righteousness of his own. On the road to Damascus, he was confronted by the one who was truly righteous, the only one who can bear that, there's only one that can bear that title, the righteous one. And it became clear to him how foolish and how futile was any attempt to establish his own righteousness. But it also dawned on him that the righteous one, in Isaiah's words, makes many to be counted righteous because he bears their iniquities. In other words, Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. So, what did Paul need to do Well, God made it clear through Ananias, verse 16, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on His name. I think it's hard for us to understand how radical that was. The The Jews practiced baptism for Gentile converts. Gentile converts were dirty, They were unclean, they were sinful, and they needed to be cleansed. And so, if a Gentile became Jewish by conversion, he would be baptized. Jews were not baptized. Paul, the Jew of Jews, the Hebrew of Hebrews, the Pharisee of Pharisees says, I needed to be washed clean, and only Jesus could do it. Only Jesus could do it. It's a remarkable scene there in Damascus, two 
devout Jews, one of them peerless in his obedience to the law, the other, Paul makes clear to point out at verse 12, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, but, but what, together they know there is one way to be righteous before God, which is not to be good enough for Him, none of us can be, but to call on the name of the righteous one. The God of our fathers showed me this, says Paul, and then He sent me to be a witness to everyone about what He had seen and heard. It's lovely that bit at the end, verse, verse 19, you've got this little exchange, Paul tries to persuade God. You know, God says, oh, you need to leave Jerusalem, you need to get out, they're not going to believe you. And Paul says, look, but look, I'm the perfect person to tell them. You know, I'm, I'm Jewish and I persecuted the way. If, I, if I'm now saying that it's true, surely they'll… And, you know, God just says, God, just go, go. I have, I have other plans for you. Verse 21, go, for I will send you far away to the… And then the word that sparks the riot all over again, to the Gentiles. That one word is enough, despite everything that Paul has said, to reignite the riot. They can't take it. Away with such a fellow from the earth, 22. He should not be allowed to live, which is interesting, isn't it? It should tell us, if nothing else, that you cannot measure the, the rightness or faithfulness of a sermon or of an apologetics talk or of a personal conversation with a friend or a family member by the immediate results that follow. And, and if you're not quite convinced by that, Luke himself told us in Luke chapter 4 about a visit by Jesus early in His ministry to His hometown of Nazareth. And what did He say? He pointed out in the synagogue that day a number of Gentiles in the Old Testament who had showed more faith than the Jews. And what happened? They threw Him out, and they tried to kill Him. Gentiles. That's the problem. Gentiles. This is our faith. This is our God, and no one else can have Him. Part of the purpose of truth is to identify those who have ears to hear and those who don't. Jesus said, this will be your opportunity to bear witness. But He also said more than that. It's really interesting. He said two things. He said both that He would give words and wisdom so that none of our adversaries would be able to withstand or contradict us, and that we'd be hated for His name's sake and some of us put to death. Well, what do you mean by that? If they can't withstand or contradict us, surely we persuade them and then they become Christians. No, no. The reason they put you to death is that they can't contradict you. That's what makes them angry. They're caught. They're lost. They have nothing to say. And so, what do you do when people are saying things that you can't contradict and you hate what they're saying? You make them stop saying it. The martyrs of the church became martyrs not because the truths they spoke were not clear and compelling, but because they were. Unrepentant sinners hated it. The culture we live in, well, it's hard ground at the moment, isn't it? These are not easy days to commend the gospel, although it is worth remembering that no one is throwing stones at us, no one is killing us. Nonetheless, not easy, but all the more important then, when God gives us opportunity to bear witness, to do as Paul did, compassionate and courageous, willing to pay a price if that's what it takes, calm and coherent, demonstrating the rationality of faith and how it answers to the human condition, clear and compelling, a personal testimony to the power of God as we have seen it in our own lives. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Let's pray. Father, thank You for these words. Thank You for this wonderful gospel. We thank You that it is true. We thank You that You have not asked us to go out and commend to people a message that is, that is false. You have not asked us to track, 
tra trap people or trick people. We, we do not use underhanded ways or cunning. We simply speak the truth, the truth as you have graciously shown it to us, the truth as it is in Jesus. Thank you for the truth of the gospel, and thank you for the power of personal testimony to your grace in our lives. Thank you that each one of us, if we're trusting in Christ, each one of us has a story of your mercy shown to us, taking us from the paths down which we wandered or keeping us from the paths down which we would have wandered, but for your mercy towards us. Help us, we pray. Lord, help us as you give us opportunity to bear witness, to do so with faithfulness, to be bold, to be clear, to be confident in you, and to make Christ known. For in his name we ask it. Amen.